So we'll kick it off. Um, hi guys, JC here from Ebtide Tackle. If you don't know me, I run Ebtide with uh, with Andy Smith. It's a, a a boutique and specialist online tackle shop, really aimed at um, at casting gear. I'm pumped tonight to be talking to you about Murray Cod. It's a species that goes way back in my past to my childhood growing up in Shepparton. And uh, chasing cod back then to chasing cod now looks completely different. There's actually virtually no similarity, um, to be honest. Now, around 15 years ago or so, um, I'm not as young as I look, around 15 years ago, I started to fish much less with bait and I switched more into casting lures. I like the, the interactive nature of casting lures and you're always thinking it's more active and um, bait fishing somewhat more, more passive. So it's about 99% of my fishing is actually lure casting. And what I've discovered along the way is how many species out there are adaptable to uh, being caught on a lure. A lot of species that people thought otherwise weren't targets for, for lure fishing. And um, w when I was much younger uh, with my dad, you know, we, we, we caught a lot of cod on bait, but he had floppies, he had the aeroplane spinners, he had the flatfish. And to be honest, I never saw a lot happen on those lures. Um, not a lot of results. Um, I don't know why back then, uh, cod fishing was probably a bit harder, but uh, the results we're seeing on lures now is significantly different. And I think it's probably the way we're fishing them. It's probably fish numbers recovering um, and it's, uh, it's refined techniques for sure. Now, I won't go out and say that catching a cod on a bait is easy, like as in a dead bait. But I will tell you this, it's a hell of a lot easier than it is on a cast lure. You earn every fish that you catch on the cast and it is really rewarding to get um, a, a good fish in particular, but any cod, to commit to your artificial offering. You've, you've essentially fooled them into making a mistake, whereas catching a cod on a, on a dead bait, it's, they're just picking up what they would normally do. There's, there's not a lot of fooling going on there. It's just you know, nature taking its course. But uh, when you get them to eat an artificial, um, you, you have won for that, uh, for that brief moment. And um, even getting a hit some days feels, feels really good. And cod on the cast is growing in popularity hugely. Um, not just the, the higher end swim baiting, which, uh, which I love, it's my, one of my passions, but just by whatever method, um, more and more people are getting into fishing for cod and especially by lures. So we'll get into it tonight, guys. So I'm gonna throw this right at the start so you've got it fresh in your minds. When this show ends, we are gonna go over to the Ebb Tide Tackle stand in the exhibit hall and we are going to be available for live chat for as long as you want to tonight um, we'll be online to talk lure fishing to talk cod to talk gear whatever you like but online right now is andy from ebb tide and cameron mcgregor that's not cameron in the photo there that's his business river escapes cameron is a murray cod guide fly and lure fishing operates out of a, a host of um, waterways in Vic, but mostly Lake Mulwala and Lake Eildon. Cam's a guru. Um, what he doesn't know about cod is that not worth knowing. A, a day on the water with him is not just about, oh, we might try and catch a fish. The education that he goes through is second to none. So those guys are online right now and I'll be joining them uh, at the end of this presentation. So let's get into the prezzo. So a little bit about the fish. If you haven't fished for cod before, here's the, I guess the brief rundown. They're the apex predator of the Murray Darling, um, the endemic for that, uh, that region and a host of tributaries. We're seeing cod introduced to areas now where they, it's, it's beyond their actual normal range. Um, for example, there's, a, there's actually an illegal population in the Yarra River in Melbourne. Um, it's been there for a very long time and they've done actually very, very well. Um, fisheries are now stocking Rocklands Reservoir over in the west, which is way out of the Murray Cods range. But again, there's a illegally introduced population there anyway, and they're doing really well. What we're seeing is fisheries management, both in Victoria and interstate, recognising the adaptability of the species and 
people want to catch them. People are really flocking to catching native fish. Uh, I'm not going to put down trout in any way <clears throat> or yeah, introduce species, but there is a, a real yearning of people to get back to catching um, cod and, and yellows for that, for that matter. Now, a little bit about cod. They're, um, as they get big, they're, they're really highly territorial. They're actually quite an aggressive species. They'll eat each other. Um, they'll eat crustaceans. They'll eat birds. They'll eat fish. They'll even let, eat land animals if they happen to stray into their... Um, to their zone and uh, and the fish, you know, uh, are happy taking on a target that big. Cod have had a pretty tough time in Australia going back through 60s, 70s, 80s, even even way back. They were really overfished. And, you know, the, the generation before us, like my, my, my dad, they abused cod, um, hand on heart, they, but they didn't know. They didn't know. They took absolutely everything. They took the big fish and the population just couldn't sustain. But, but you know, let's not hang them. They, they didn't know what they were doing at the time. And cod was seen as food. But we've done a big disservice to cod as well by how we've managed waterways. Um, they, they, dams aren't good for cod. They, they release cold water, which is quite bad for breeding and egg production. And it blocks the natural upstream movement of cod as they, um, they want to spawn. And th there's removal of snags, there's a host of things that we've done to cod that um, just are not good for them. Can't put exactly a timestamp on this, but say, let's uh, give it roughly 10 years ago, things have started to change around that point and significantly for the better. We're seeing snags being put back into waterways. <coughs> We're seeing extensive stocking of cod, both in their natural range and whilst say somewhere like Lake Eildon actually is their natural range because the Goulburn River runs through Lake Eildon and that's a, a natural habitat of cod. Um, but the lake's not. The lake, the lake is man-made, but the fish are thriving in there. So what we are seeing is that cod are safe. They're, they're not going to become extinct. In fact, they're coming back quite strongly. But uh, perhaps in the rivers, you know, they're, they're going to need a hand. They're going to need protecting and... It, when it comes down to actually um, taking a cod, if you want to take one from a place like Lake Eildon within your bag limit uh, and within the slot, slot limit, you shouldn't feel bad. Those fish are introduced. They're, it's seen as a put and take fishery. But, you know, out of the Murray, perhaps you might give second thoughts or the, or, or the Darling or the Goulburn. I'm not saying don't, but, you know, you might give it some thought because those fish probably do it a little bit harder. So... Cod can go grow pretty big. Um, it's, a, it's a shame that my image is blocking that, uh, that fish in the corner, which is absolutely a, a beast thing. Um, a metre is seen as the, the trophy benchmark. Um, don't know whether that's fair because you get some absolutely magnificent fish that are, you know, 75, 80 centimetres, but a, a metre is the mark. And um, a metre 20 is like that really true, absolute trophy mark that I think everyone strives for. Every year or two, a fish hits a net that um, will give that 100 pound mark a nudge. And we've seen a, a, a couple probably in this, this year alone. And uh, it, it's just a testament to how big these fish can grow uh, in the right conditions. But um, they're not just stupid eating machines. They're actually really... Um, quite discerning and fussy for, for most of the, um, the, the time. Anyone who keeps cod in a tank will tell you how temperamental they can be. And they're, they're a great fish tank pet, uh, quite easy to get hold of too from fish farms. They can go sometimes three or four days where they're just not interested in food. And you might look at things like the barometer, moon phase, etc., and try and work out why these fish aren't feeding. But Sometimes there's just no reason for it. They get quite moody and temperamental and tend to become very structure orientated. They'll sit under their log and not do um, any eating. And then they switch on where they will basically for a period of time, it might only be short, they'll eat anything that comes within their range. You know, you drop 10 yabbies in the tank and bang, they'll smash them all out one after one. So bear that in mind in terms of when you're out fishing for cod and you are lure casting. On the days where you are flogging the water and not getting any feedback, no result, no love. They, they do, do my head in those days because I, I always wonder and I say to the guys I fish, you know, 
How many fish did we pass? How many fish saw my lure? How many fish responded to my lure? You know, just, I'd, I'd love to have that feedback. And the guys that are running the new generation of forward facing live scope sonar, are giving us some really interesting information about cod. So they're, they're, they're sending these fish forward of the, the boat with live sonar and they're seeing them respond to their lures. Sometimes it's, they're turning away and, and leaving the environment. They're just, they want nothing to do with it. In other occasions, they'll rise up to the lure or, or go and check out the lure and turn away. So it really becomes a game of absolute persistence. We know that there are cod out there that refuse to eat our lures. Um, sometimes they just don't want to, to eat. You know, uh, it might be just a bit of inquisitism, inquisitiveness that, uh, that they come and have a look. Let's not confuse cod on the cast as easy, but that's part of the whole satisfaction of, of finally getting one to have a go for you. The um, one lucky thing I think about us as cod anglers, pretty much any environment we go to to target cod is um, the environment's beautiful. Um, whether it's the Murray, the Goulburn, um, Eildon or Mulwala, we're surrounded by, you know, a, a really cool environment, which, you know, helps us get through those times when we're waiting to get crunched. And it's certainly, um, it, I haven't had a day's cod fishing where I wished I was at work, that's for sure. So I'm gonna give you a short video about, I don't know, a little teaser about a few things I love about cod. Got on him. Chicken smell off to harass him off. Oh, shit. So that's just a minute of, uh, I guess, cod life. And uh, it's a really strong catch and release community. And uh, I think we all live for those violent takes and top water hits that, um, that cod of all sizes uh, are capable of. It's not just, not just about big trophy fish, this whole caper. So we'll get into a little bit about um, the, the nitty gritty details about you know, how, how to catch cod on the cast. And I think understanding a bit about their annual cycle is good to inform your fishing. And uh, the, it, it, it'll, it'll kind of determine whether you want to be a trophy hunter and, and put in those hard yards to just get a big fish or whether you're just you know, happy to catch cod. Um, for, for me, cod season, my cod season begins in May. Uh, when the days get shorter, the weather, uh, the water and the air temperature gets cooler and cod tend to start to slow down a little bit. The, um, the smaller fish in particular, and for, for my money, from the guys that I've spoken to extensively about this, and there's a bit of science behind this as well, the fish that aren't of spawning age begin to go a little bit dormant during that colder weather. Now uh, the big fish, it's quite different for them, the ones that are of spawning age. And that um, shortening of the days and the cooling of the water temperature is actually a signal for bigger fish to commence to feed up and often prey on larger food items as they seek to put on condition and get ready for the spawn spring. Now bear in mind that the actual spawning event can vary greatly from year to year and from waterway to waterway exactly when it's going to happen but it's largely thought as a spring activity and the closed season that we have is engineered around that. But let's not think for a moment that spawning activities may not happen before that season or after that season, it all depends. But what we see is them feed up and through um, probably May through to 
the start of September. Um, that's what I call big swim boat season, where big cod are actually on the prowl and they are looking to feed on big food items. And that's a prime time to target the big girls. And it's a cold and lonely winter grind sometimes, but it is when you've, you're pretty much nearly eliminated getting a bite from the small guys, you're using bigger baits and you're purely targeting those big fish. And what we see in towards the end of winter, uh, start of spring, is you'll see actually, I'm speaking in um, terms of lakes now, you'll sometimes actually see aggregations of cod and um, the, the image down the bottom of the screen, the screenshot is actually two cod paired up. Um, I've got a screenshot actually, it's a short bit of video, not a screenshot of what I think is 11 cod all together um, at a point in Lake Eildon before they, you know, they sort themselves out, they work out who's pairing up with who and they fight and, and off they go to do the, um, the spawning activity. And they, they sure do fight, there's no doubt about that. During that period of time, you can actually still fish Lake Hilton, um, provided you're not in the flow. Um, the, the, the rivers are off limit. But it's actually quite interesting is um, my, my experience with spawning cod is they're actually not very t uh, interested in eating and the bites that you get from them are more territorial. They're actually just trying to, you know, get your bait, your, your lure out of the way. So, um, you know, to fish or not to fish is a whole other matter. But I think it's really important to understand this if you just want to catch a cod, honestly, the open season at the start of December through summer is the time. You're going to catch cod in numbers. You go to a place like Mulwala, get it on the right day, you might catch 20 fish. Um, not saying that you will, but, you know, that's kind of like those, one of those really good days that you might get there. Whereas um, the winter game is, you, you're pretty damn happy if you catch one good cod, you've had a good day. Now, another question that comes up a lot about cod is when to fish for them. And there's a bunch of uh, factors to consider. And I don't want to overcomplicate it too much and get into the solo owner charts. I want to keep this chat flowing and not too much bogged down in technicalities. But I think the time of the day is a worthwhile discussion. Um, I've, I've fished a lot through the 24 hour clock period and, and um, have got enough experience of targeting him through through that different time zones and light zones to to um, put forward to you what I view as the prime bite times. And the best one for me, bar none, is a change of light at dawn. That would be the one time if you said you can go and fish for um, one hour today, it would be around that, and that's the only time it'd be then. The next best for me would be the same transition to um, low light at dusk. Take me into that very late arvo into the point where we go through dusk, no light. It's, that's my number two. Number three would be any time through the night. Cod have got very good night vision and they are active at night. Um, it's harder to fish for them at night. Doesn't mean they're easy, but they're definitely more active than say the middle of the day. Don't get me wrong, caught plenty of fish through the middle of the day, but there are probably other factors related to that. The one thing I'll say about um, uh, other factors, not Salona, but barometer. Um, I love the barometer to be moving. In fact, my favorite barometer movement in, in, in terms of when to fish for cod is when the barometer is crashing, when there is a foul weather event approaching. Um, you nearly always get a bite. The thing that's difficult is when to, when will that bite come? Will it come 12 hours before the, the bad weather comes or what, does it happen as the storm, you know, hits you and the lightning starting and, and that kind of thing. By the way, I do not recommend that. I've been out in that too many times and it scares the uh, bejesus out of me. But uh, generally there's a bite window somewhere there if you're on the water. So dawn gets a big thumbs up and uh, dusk is next best for me. It's probably no great secret there. So we'll move on to the gear. We're gonna have a bit of a chat mostly about the different lure types and when you might use them. But what I wanna do wanna say um, about this particular slide is baitcasters. Why do we use baitcasters for, for Murray Cod? Quite simply for mine, it is the accuracy you get out of a baitcaster. You can 
stop the trajectory of a, of a lure within millimetres, within an inch, um, with a bait caster that you just can't do with the spin reel, especially when you're throwing a bigger bait. Um, accuracy really does matter with cod, being able to land your lure right where you wanted it to be. Not a bit long, not a bit short, but right on the money is a significant factor in catching more fish. So if you getting into this and you're, you're a bit intimidated by bait casters, what I say to you is overcome that. Um, get out there, practice, get your bait caster, go to the park, do it in your backyard, cast, 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 put a plug on and get used to, to hitting targets. And um, the reality is after you've done a bit of practice, you'll work out that there is absolutely nothing to fear from bait casters. So when we get into the types of lures that um, you can use for cod fishing, um, I'll throw this, this thought up. Um, there are kind of two broad categories. Realism, those lures that actually look like a fish and swim like a fish, versus the impressionalism of something that really doesn't look like a fish, but by vibration or flash, it just might be food. And we're encouraging the fish to strike that perhaps more out of um, maybe anger or curiosity or just that thought that that might be food versus the realism camp where, you know, that really does look like a fish and it swims like a fish. So bear that in mind when you're talking about fish that have seen a lot of lures and a lot of baits and, you know, a lot of spinner baits. So I'm not saying they don't work because they absolutely do and I use them in certain circumstances, but bear that thought in mind. So when you go out to tackle cod and you're going to go spend a 10 hour day casting your butt off, I guess having um, faith in the, uh, the bait or lure that you tie on is really important. Um, my good friend, Kristen Georgopoulos has got a new um, clothing brand around um, lure fishing and uh, it's about bait religion. And I'm wearing one of his hats right now, actually. And uh, it's so true. It's having absolute faith, a religious faith in the, the lure that you've got tied on. And whatever that might be, if you've got confidence, you know what, use it. Because that will just keep you, you going and you keep you believing as you uh, do cast after cast with no result. So first bait that we're going to have a look at are wake baits. Um, love these guys. They're, they're typified by a very sharply angled bib. You might confuse them um, sometimes for being like a diver or a crankbait, but the angle of the bib is close to vertical. And I'm not sure how well you're going to see that. Very vertical bib, which will keep that lure, because they're all floating, will keep that lure up near the surface of the water. You can make them go subsurface by adding a chin weight. And if you're able to see my mouse, I'm going to go down to that mega bass garuda there and you'll see actually a chin weight hanging off it. So you can make that um, go subsurface. These really got a lifelike swim. That bib makes them actually a very slow bait, which I think is a key to Murray Cod luring. And they're very good at not getting snagged. Um, big favorite of mine. So there's a variety of uh, different wake baits um, that you might find on the market. So hard swim baits and glide baits. Um, they are possibly the most realistic baits in how they look and how they swim. They need to be fished really slow. And the, the addition of chin weights is a bit of a detractor for them. Um, it, it kills a little bit of action. Like, don't get me wrong, I do do it. But I, I believe that um, hard swim baits actually lend themselves to being fished in shallower water on active fish, more so than, um, you know, when we, we, we're struggling and we're looking down deep. And um, it's an interesting discussion around uh, what's what, that's a glide bait. And what makes a glide bait is only one join right in the middle of the bait and they're two equal balanced parts. If you cast this, it'll actually helicopter because the, um, the, the, the two ends, there's no weight in one end or the other end, they're equally weighted. Um, and uh, swim baits are typically multi-jointed baits. 
they can have, you know, you know, that's got uh, one, two, three joints. Um, could be two, could be, could be even more than that. And these are, they're actually super easy to use. Glide baits take a little bit more skill to get the rhythm out of. And um, they really are one that you actually got to have a lot of faith to, uh, to fish. Um, I've been trying to fish glides more and more. And um, I haven't quite got the success that I want, um, but I, I'm definitely going to persist because I think they've got huge potential in the right environment. There's a host of um, different swim baits and, and glide baits there. So soft swim baits, which are absolutely uh, my, my favourite to use. They're very easy to use. You can work them shallow or deep. Typically, it is... The, um, there's a, a paddle tail on the back of the bait that's, that's like a bit of a boot or like on this mag draft. Very, they've got a very soft, um, where am I? There I am. They've got a very soft tail section and this bit here is that creates a, a thump. The, the, the whole key around a, a soft swim bait for me is a reasonable amount of action at a super, super slow speed. Um, they can be uh, a little bit snaggy depending on the hook configuration, but I, I always say this to, to guys about swim baiting, um, especially in lakes, um, throwing around expensive lures, is don't stress too much about, oh, you know, going to lose a hundred dollar lure. Um, if, if you're not driving the hooks into every snag you hit thinking it's a fish, if you feel that you're hung up in timber, generally taking the boat over the top of it and just jiggling it off or using a, a tackle back. I don't lose many lures, to be honest. Um, but yeah, if, if you're driving the hooks into every second snag that you've got, you're probably um, going to lose a few. But um, soft swim baits, cod love them. They suck them in like lollipops. And um, I probably catch more cod on that than I do um, any other lure in impoundments. Uh, there's a range of different um, soft swim baits. Crank baits and divers. Or um, what a lot of Aussies would call them would be um, hard bodies. It's just a bit of an Australian term. Um, so divers are, or crank baits are typified by, again, a bib like the wake bait, but it will be more um, in tune with the angle of the lure. And the more, the bigger it is, and the more in tune with the shape of the lure, generally the deeper it will dive. Um, you know, you, you get uh, crankbaits that will go down seven and a half, eight metres on, um, perhaps not on the cast, more on the troll. But, um, you know, that, that's their potential. Um, I find crankbaits are sensational for um, working edges, searching edges positioning the boat off the edge of the bank a little bit and actually casting right to virtually the shoreline and working that back to the boat. You can cover a lot of water, you can search really well with the crankbait and they offer a big, big vibration which can really help in uh, dirty water situations as well. There's a range of different crankbaits you can see. I'll use the mouse again. Um, Catafara mud honey is there, a bit of Aussie built. You'll see um, this mega bass uh, big M 7.5, big bib, large bib, and it's you know quite straight in line, parallel with the body. That's typical of your uh, your crankbait builds. Surface paddlers and creepers. So, um, these lures really ring the dinner bell. they they it's the most visual and spectacular way to fish for Murray cod. Cod are very attuned to what's happening above them um, on the surface of the water. And, uh, it, you know, I, I think it comes from the, the undeniable fact that they, they eat a lot of land at mammal, mammals rather, and, um, and birds like water hens and ducks. Um, they, they smash them. There's no doubt about it. There's been plenty pulled out of the gullets of uh, a big cod. Uh, they, these are great lures. They, they are, uh, a real confidence lure to be able to throw over the nastiest of territory. We're throwing a, a lure into some spots where you go, oh, it's just, there's so much structure there. You know, I just, I know there's a fish in there somewhere, but I'm, I'm going to lose a lure or I just won't be confident fishing it slow enough to go through that nasty territory. 
but putting a creeper or a paddler over the top, you know, you can fish the, the worst territory and you aren't going to get hung up. So f- for me, they'd be the number one lure choice if I was land-based. If I was walking banks of a lake or river, this is what I'd have on and just be, um, you know, trying to, trying to pull a fish up essentially from, from the bottom. And, and they don't hesitate. There's, there's no doubt that uh, they love to come up and smash on the surface. And you see a lot of guys when they work surface lures, they work them really fast. They like to hear that rhythmic paddle. But um, some, you know, and that works, don't get me wrong. But um, I think cod have heard a lot of surface lures. They've heard them paddling above them. And Copeton was a good example a few years ago where top water was the go. It was always about top water. And then that, that slowed off a lot. And I, and I think it's because they got so used to every morning and every night at low light, there were these surface lures just like clack, clack, clack over the surface, you know, and I think they wised up to them. Um, but you can fish them super slow. You can, you can virtually fish them in place. You know, cast it out into a, a real honey hole. Let it sit there. Let it twitch. I can promise you that Dale Greenback down there knows that it is above you. Um, you know, there's different styles. Like there's your typical, there's a... Um, Catafara Joiner Joe, typical Perspex bib, um, to what I call then your creeper styles like uh, this Mega Bass Eye Wing with, with, with fold, foldable metal wings. Um, they both do different things, but I guess they're kind of from the, the same family of lures. Barambas, um, there's harrows there, and um, all kinds of biz. So spinnerbaits and chatterbaits are probably uh, with crankbaits are the, the most common and a lot of people's go-to. Um, they put out a massive vibration. They put out a lot of flash with the blades. Even a chatter blade, chatterbait blade puts out, you know, we know it vibrates, but also puts out um, flash. They put out a strong thump. For me, these lures have been seen a lot, but where I really love to use them is when you get a big snag pile, um, a log jam in a corner of a dam, in a bay or, you know, in a host of different places in a river where casting a spinner bait there, provided it's one that has blades that rotate as it falls, can be a killer. Just let that thing fall vertically down in front of the snag. Um, and yeah, it, you, you can get crunched on the drop quite often, especially if those blades spin on the drop. So they've all got their place, all those lures and um you know different circumstances and different styles so we're going to move on and have a look at two waterways they're both impoundments we're going to look at Eildon in some detail and we'll move on to Mulwala as well i regard them as the two premier um waterways we've got in in Vic, I know um, Mulwala is on the border, but you know a lot of people from Victoria do go north and um, hit up Mull. Um, they're quite different. They're really different waterways, and we'll highlight that. But uh, the, the the fact with Eildon being only two hours away is superb. It, it is such a awesome lake. I love it. It's my it's my thing. Um, I love getting up there midweek, especially if I can. And we're really starting to see Eildon come into fruition as the trophy fishery that um, we spoke about potential for so long about Eildon, about, you know, oh, the potential to be the best. But we're seeing now really regular catches, um, super regular. Um, I, I think it's really kicked in over the last three winters of people are really cottoned onto it. And like fish in the 90s are just the reg. Um, you know, we're not seeing meteries all the time, but just so many fish in the nineties, but yeah, the, the meteries are starting to tick through when the, the meter tens and the meter twenties, we know are there. And, um, I, I'll, I'll be super surprised if Eildon doesn't produce those fish of gigantic proportions, but it's certainly got fish in numbers that, you know, that people want to catch. Um, really reckon it's important to make a small point here about Eildon. Um, big amount of money has been spent of taxpayers' money putting these fish in this lake. No one owns them. Whether you've fished Eildon for five years, 10 years or 20, um, it's only right that uh, Eildon's gonna see more boat pressure. It's gonna see more fishing pressure. 
But guess what? Those fish have been put there for everyone. So no one owns them. And um, I guess get used to it. And let's all be um, considerate of each other in the waterway. So Eildon Trophies. Um, we, like, you know, I'm kind of going back over this a tiny little bit, but we are seeing fish of gigantic proportions, really fast growth rates. And there's goggles. That's uh, one that really ignited our winter last year. And uh, this beast of Darren Weeder, like, look, look at the head on this thing. It's kind of like got a body that looks like it's growing faster than its head and the, the tail rest on it. That's a, just a freaking giant, that thing. So we get asked this heaps. Where do you catch your cod in Eildon? As in like your big cod. And I chuck this map together of places that I personally, I've fished Eildon hard for, I don't know, is it about six, seven years now, something like that. Done a lot of hours, a lot of trips, a lot of donuts. But I've caught some good fish and I've not caught some good fish that I've um, seen. And that's just a broad map of places that I have run into good fish. And I'm talking 90s or better. So I don't know if I could have got a more even distribution across the entire lake. It's a vast waterway. But when people say, you know, oh, where, do, where do I need to go in Eildon? Like, seriously, throw a dart. Um, but what I will say is, if you decide that, that that's your area, commit to that area for a good period of time and get to know it, get to learn it. And mind you, you're only learning it at that water level at that time. You're not, you know, th there was one place that uh, remember um, Lydia and I, uh, my wife, we caught 17 fish in a spring in this one very small area. I haven't caught a fish there since. Um, and the lake level has significantly changed. And I think that's a big factor in why there were fish there then and aren't now. So big thing to remember with this place is that when, what's a good spot now and a good bank now might be nothing in um, a, a percentage or two, let alone, you know, 10 or 15. <clears throat> so finding fish in Eildon, having just said that you can find them anywhere, um, we've obviously got to go into it a, a bit deeper to work out, you know, how, how you might go about a, approaching Eildon and breaking it down somewhat and um, actually finding uh, the fish to catch. Um, it's, it's such a vast waterway. It's huge. Um, it's, it's a very, very big body of water. And as I said, 1% can make a huge difference. So it, it's largely, if you haven't been there a while, you're almost learning it again when you go back. Um, certainly, you know, I, only, I fish Eildon from May till, I, I really don't go there. Once the, the wake boats hit, once like kind of people break for the Christmas holidays, I don't go back until the following May. So when I come back, the lake's change. Um, that's, that's a fact. And your, your own circumstances will be different about um, how you find the lake when, when you get to it. So... Wherever you drive around on the banks, you'll see, you know, lay downs or clusters of logs or whatever. Like I look at this and that's not a particularly exciting lay down. There's a lot of rot that's happened there and not much left, but they're jammed together. So I, could, I can imagine a fish perhaps holding station there for, for a while if the water was up over that. So when you're driving along and you see a, a spot like this covered by water, you know, you give it a few casts, but... For the most part, I don't spend too much time on one thing unless it looks completely amazing or you know a fish is there that you've sanded up and you want to, you know, you want to really try and do your best to get a bite from him. That's fair enough. But for the most part, I, I fish Eildon in an active sense. I, um, I hit the spots that I think are likely um, and, and literally it'll be three casts move a bit, three casts, move a bit. I'm looking for the fish that actually wants to eat because there is so much water. I want to just like concentrate on the guy that who actually is up and about and wants to have dinner and I don't get too zoned into one particular spot. Now, understanding the lake is really, really important. Determining where the original water course is, is a big part of that for my money. It helps me work out where the flats are. And at this particular level of this shot, 
you know, a fair bit is quite obvious. It's, I think it's, it's fairly easy to deduce uh, by my green line there where the actual um, water course would be, which tells me that area will be a drop off and deeper, but likely out from that, the typical thing you get with a uh, river and face it, wherever you go in Eildon, a river is running through that area. Um, you know, the, the level of the lake mightn't make that fishable right now, but you know, in, in the right level it will. And this tells me straight away, there's a bunch of really good spots. Like there's, there's a cracker right here on the left where my mouse is. This whole flat looks really, really likely to me. Lots of timber, likely to be holding bait. Bait likes a point, likes to hang around the back or the front of it, um, often current dependent. And that's a whole area that I like, but I see a lot of different aspects of this shot that I like. Um, it's, it's a smaller area, but there's a flat here on the right too, um, before it drops off quickly into the river against the wall. So you've got two things there. You've got the structure of the wall, the rock, um, then a flat with the timber before it drops into the river. So they're the things that I'm thinking about as I approach Eildon. So here's another area in the lake and you see a very steep bank on your left which is suggestive maybe that falls into quite deep water. And I don't like deep water for, for um, fishing for cod in Eildon. The zone I like to concentrate on is probably be between three and 10 meters at the deep side. But so th this bank drops off quite fast, but you can see by the tree line here that under the water, it flattens out somewhat. And I suggest you've got a flat there um, that's well worth fishing before you get to the outer edge of those trees where it's probably going to drop off significantly. So I'd be pretty comfortable moving along this edge, casting forward, casting between the, the uh, gaps with whatever your preferred lure is. Um, uh, that's a, a great spot for a, for a swim bait. You could also use a crankbait, but you know, honestly, whatever you like. Um, and up ahead is a point. Um, I already spoke about points that bait likes to congregate on one side or the other of a point quite often and where there's bait you will probably find cod so that's just one how one way you know you might approach that and that's how i how i would um wherever you go in eildon you will find gullies where you know little little creeks have come down to join the main um, river arm or whatever they're all through the lake there's not an area without gullies and you will often get a real concentration of um, timber there, both standing timber because the gully, even when the lake's dry or out of the water, that area remains wet and uh, vegetation will spring up there quite quickly. But also log jams get created by the flow, um, both coming down the gully and coming down the arm and logs concentrate in these areas right now. And that, my friends is a hot zone right there. Um, I reckon all through the lake when you get these little gullies and log jams, each one of those has got a fish on it. Whether you get a, a bite's another matter or whether he's home, he might be out looking for a feed elsewhere. But um, you, you often get a, a, a residential kind of scenario with those log jams. And that's actually a place where um, throwing a spinner bait is a really good idea. Throwing it into just the edge of the danger zone and letting it free fall down the face of that. Um, also a really good spot to throw in a surface lure. Throw a surface lure right into the back of that, let it sit, give it a twitch, let it sit. And uh, if there's something home, you will be agitating the hell out of it to, uh, to come out and have a crack at it. Whereas a cast lure that's just dragged straight back out, pretty easy to ignore. Something that's just sitting up there and not going away is um, pretty tempting. So another um, aerial and thanks to Darren Weeder, in-depth angler for a couple of these um, drone shots. So the, there's a bunch in this photo, like there, there's a host of things. Those uh, green circles, those scribbles are areas that I'd love to hit. I love points, but that whole far bank looks really enticing to me. And you know, what you got in front of it, you there could be in Eildon in all seriousness, that's a, that's a day's fishing. Um, and you could work that zone and, and not move out of it all, at, at least a morning. So, Eildon Forage, the main food sources, this is not the only food in Eildon, 
is roach and redfin. Um, those that hardcore fish for reddies uh, often report that there's less reddies around these days than there used to be, and that could well be because there's more cod eating them. But there are tons of roach. <clears throat> They're um, in huge numbers, and whenever the fisheries electrofish in low light, they find huge schools of roach. Uh, they tend to push up into the shallows at night and you'll see them flicking around on the surface at dawn. Um, and then when the light hits the water, they tend to go a little bit deeper. It really adds to that whole thing about dawn being the prime time is because the bait's actually actually up a lot shallower. So, um, you know, have a look at both those. They, they're fish, they look like swim baits to me. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I love fishing swimmies so much. So a few soundings, I'm um, big on my sonar. Um, now, this is bait on both side and down scan. You look at the um, side scan on the left there, you'll see that's a hard rock wall. You can see the rock and it flattens out to be mud out on this side. So um, not giving too much away, that's a flat and you can see the bait on it. And um, we, whilst there's no cod in that sanding, we got one very nearby that. Um, don't think of cod in lakes as stationary. They get out and swim around and chase this down. Um, there's way more bait there in very shallow water. You can see all the shadows from the bait. That's pretty big bait. I'm not sure or convinced what that bait was. Um, but knowing bait is in the area is a very good idea to concentrate and stay around there. There's a couple of paired cod. I showed you that one a little bit earlier. Here's some actual fish. Now, you don't always catch the cod that you sound up. That's a fact. But it's really good to know that they're in the area because they won't be the only one. Um, we have caught some that we've sounded up, but you know, by, by far, we more often do not. Um, and, and the guys that run um, the new technology, the forward-looking live stuff are t uh, saying that as well, that you know, they, they see more, way more than they actually catch. But uh, that's a big fish right there. That's, um, uh, I, I think, a fish of well over a metre. Um, I didn't get a bite from him that day, but I did a week or two later and I blew it. Um, there's another one. You can see him on both down scan and side scan. And there is another one. There he is on the side scan, right in the beam, and there's his shadow. So it's a... Um, Good sonar, I actually reckon, is essential, to be honest. You can be, um, if nothing else, to know that you're fishing in the zones that you want to be. It doesn't have to be about the actual fish. So we've got a bunch of resources on our YouTube. Um, Eptide Tackle on YouTube. Um, this is one of them, Swim Baiting Lake Eildon. We put a lot of time into putting this video together. We caught a lot of fish doing it, and we learned a lot. So it's a, if you want a little bit of a crash course, in swim baiting like Eildon, well worth a look, but there's a bunch of other Murray Cod videos. Most of them are from, from Eildon on our YouTube. Check them out. So we're gonna move on to um, Lake Eildon. Um, for those of you, sorry, did I say Lake Eildon? Lake Mulwala is what I meant. So for those of you that don't know, um, Mulwala is not natural. It's, uh, it exists because of the weir at Yarrawonga on the Murray River, and it's uh, the flooded red gum forest that remains. So all the lowlands is basically filled up with water. It's so different from Eildon by virtue of it being a lowland where Eildon in the Alpine regions is so deep. You know, Eildon's 50, 60, 70 metres deep in the deepest parts. The deepest parts of um, Mulwala are more determined by the river course, the Murray River course that runs through it. There's significant areas of mull that are, you know, metre, two metres, three metres is kind of deeper. Um, so it's, it's so different. The, a lot of your, what you apply at Eildon kind of goes a little bit out the window here. A cast anywhere in any direction at Mulwala may yield a fish. If you look at uh, the top left, bottom right, you know, they're both photos when the lake has been drawn down, when they draw it down every few winters to kill the invasive weed species. So uh, the frost kills them. They always do it in winter, which is a crying shame when they do it because um, 
can't fish it. But uh, it's necessary because that, that weed gets out of control. It really does take over the flats um, every few summers. <coughs> um, my whaler enjoys a much more stable water level than Eildon does. So when you learn things about my whaler, there are chances that you can reapply that time and time again, year after year, because the water level doesn't fluctuate to a huge extent, except for when they do a drawdown. You know, you have small flooding events there, but it's generally controlled by the Yarrawonga Weir. And your knowledge at Mulwala, I'd keep really guarded close because it's going to apply year after year after year. So I really love Mulwala for its, um, it's got a lot of versatility, but I love it especially for its suitability for fishing surface lures all day. Also for swim baiting, um, shallow running swim baits. And it's a perfect spot, place to um, fly fish for cod. And that's one of the places and the reasons why Cam McGregor from River Escapes uh, hits up uh, Mulwala so often is its suitability through those shallow flats. There are a hell of a lot of cod in Mulwala. Lots of these 45 to 75 centimetre fish uncountable numbers and the interesting thing is that mole whaler isn't stopped it is a natural spawning event that occurs there you know probably every spring um, some some years would be better than others no doubt but that it's self-sustaining and i think there's not too many places like it to be honest it doesn't require man-made support and there are you know so so many of these little ones but there are some tanks. There are some absolute tanks in this joint. It's funny, you often see skinny fish in Mulwala and often they are the smaller ones. Um, and I'll get to that later when I talk about their food sources, but the bigger ones, not so much so. And I think it's because they switch up to bigger food sources like carp and birds. But um, yeah, there are no shortage of big fish in Mulwala as well. So there is a huge diversity to the landscape there that you've got your um, backwaters and billabongs, which are pretty closely held secrets. There's a um, the over, sorry, the aerial shot there of the lake drawn down shows the, the, the vast flats that you've got, but the billabongs that exist and the lay downs and of course the river course. Um, the river course itself is obviously home to a refuge for the fish to fall back into when they, uh, they don't want to be up on the flats. I, I generally regard that when fish are on the flats, for the most part, they're probably feeding uh, unless they've got a, a more significant um, lay down to go and um, take station next to perhaps. But for the most part, I think they fall back in a deeper water when they're not on the job. But there's a, you know, a plethora of environments there to chase um, fish up on the flats in shallow water. Chartered waters. I actually regard if I could make a choice between uh, chartered waters mapping or a sounder in my whaler, I would go with the map. This is an invaluable tool. Um, hit up chartered waters. Uh, we're not affiliated with them in any way. I just rate their product. Um, this overlays on your sounder and you can see in real time you know, where the creek beds are, where the, um, the log jams are, where the billabongs are. And this is where your hotspots come from. And not every one of those logs, of course, is going to hold a, uh, a fish all the time. That's a fact, but, you know, significant enough of them do. And you can really do your homework with chartered waters before you go fishing. Um, you can position yourself really, really well with these, with a fair to get degree of accuracy to um, be able to fish the lay downs properly. Sometimes the lay downs may not be visible at all above the water, but they are, um, they're on the maps because it's photos been taken during the drawdown. And you can really, you know, you can line yourself up to fish down one side, then down the other. So do, oh, excuse me, do yourself a favor and um, consider chartered waters. So in fishing mull, 
I love the flats, but I love flats that have flow over them more so. Uh, you tend to find more bait there. Like I, I literally believe every flat in Mulwala has fish on them. Every edge has fish on them. But I find the ones that have got proximity to the river course hold more bait and hold more fish. Um, there's a, a great little view here from the drone there. You can see a couple of great laydowns. And literally in Mulwala, yeah, that, that's not deep. That's near, um, I'm pretty sure that's near Majors. But that will be the kind of structure that will hold good fish um, in stark contrast, I guess, to you know, what we find at Eildon. Um, throughout the lake, you will find willows and neither that fish nor that photo are from Mulwala. Um, the, the, the fish is actually Nagambi, but you'll notice the willows in the background. So you, you've got banks in the lake and you've got a lot of areas up in um, Bundalong in the river above Mulwala that have willows. And when the wind is up in the lake, and it is often, heading up to Bundalong to fish that stretch of the river is quite a popular thing to do because the, uh, the lake gets really hard to fish if the wind is up significantly. You've got to be on the, the lee side of uh, the lake to be able to fish it sometimes. It uh, gets really choppy, bank shallow. But this Bundalong area, if you can skip baits or if you can put your cast carefully in between pockets in the willows, there are some great fish in there. And I'll tell you a little story about that um, little cod on the right. That um, was a willow tree in the Gamby and it was full of sparrows and sparrows nests. And I fired in a number of casts and uh, with, with spinner baits and chatter baits, no joy. I was able to get a couple of casts in and one in quite deep with a, um, a surface paddler. And like I said before, like leaving it still and just working it out super slowly and twitchy. Um, I've had you know, good bites from, from under that tree and uh, other people that, that I fish with. And I think that, that fish in that environment are just so super attuned to what's above them. And they're, they're actually holding station in that location because of um, bird life. So, it's a, it's a good trick to remember for mull is um, don't forget the willows, the, uh, the fish like them. Some people make commentary that, uh, that fish or cod don't like willow trees. I really disagree with, with that point of view. So here's your typical bait in um, Mulwala and it's quite different to what you get in Eildon. Goldfish. There is a hell of a lot of goldfish and Cam McGregor will swear black and blue is the major bait source in the lake. A lot of fish are found with um, shrimp with the claws hanging out of their gullet or you know the guys that, uh, that keep cod in there report a lot of shrimp in their gut. Um, what are these called again Cam? Western carp gudgeon I think he called them. He said that they're a major food source in there. They're only small. Um, but then I think when you get up into the trophy fish the big carp that in there are on the menu and we know for sure that they eat water birds, which there are a lot. You know, your water hens, your ducks, your blackies, your teal, and your um, uh, cygnets, the baby swans, are certainly on the menu for sure. So that might determine a bit about why some of the smaller cod are a bit skinny. Food might be a bit smaller and harder to source, but the uh, the better cod um, do okay and uh, and, you know, Big fish, big bait might really be a thing at Mulwala when you think about it that way. So let's continue the convo. We're kind of running towards the end here, but you have a resource online now to ask us any questions and you'll struggle to find someone like Cam McGregor that knows so much about this and he's, he's online and ready to share with you. Um, if you want to book a guide, here's a good time to have a chat with him about it because he will teach you amazing things, not just here's my best spots, but things about these fish. I spent quite a few days with Cam and um, he really short circuits the whole learning process. So please join us over there to continue the convo. Uh, our Ebb Tide YouTube channel, heaps of resources. Look along here. Murray Cod, Murray Cod, Murray Cod, Dog Tooth Tuna. Okay. There is some saltwater stuff there. Of course there is. But there is so much Murray Cod stuff on our YouTube channel. Check it out. Give us a subscribe and check out the videos, please, guys.